Most bars serve up delicious spirits, but the type of spirit this one has on the menu is of the ghastly kind. An unscrupulous undertaker, a dastardly doctor, and decades worth of restless souls. That presence you feel next to you at the bar may be from an overly friendly patron, or it could be someone chatting you up from the other side. This week's episode is Kell's Irish Pub. A bump in the night, your heart fills with dread, probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinisterhood. I'm gonna kill you. Well, the haunted bar is so nice, we covered it twice. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And when we, I like when we can go and do hands on research. Yeah. We did this as our first episode on the first stop of our tour in uh, the beautiful city of Tacoma. And um, I don't know if it was the spirits or just a policy <laughs> that the Tacoma Comedy Club has, but we couldn't record the audio. So we decided. We still wanted you guys to hear all the fun stuff that we did and the interesting lore behind this bar. So we had all the information. We're doing it again. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it was truly the spirits mm-hmm. that we were ready and uh, or we just didn't uh, clarify all that up top. Nevertheless, we did a great show. What I think was a great show. And from the feedback we got, we had a lot of fun uh, with everybody there live in the audience in Tacoma. And then afterwards, we were just riding high and then looked at each other and we're like, that wasn't recorded, was it? So, But it was still uh, a very funny show. And we got to go to the location of this and had a very wonderful tour with the owner and his wife and their lovely little daughter. They were so welcoming, so, so nice. kind. Oh, my yeah, goodness. Yeah, it was great. It took us, um, we'll go through all the air, the different areas, but mm-hmm. I mean, truly a backstage kind of behind we the did. scenes tour. It was so generous with their time. They spent a ton of time with us, just giving us the, the whole what for about this place. And it is, first of all, had a lovely lunch there. <laughs> great drinks, some great Irish fare. It yes. was a pretty mild day in Seattle. They It warmed up a bit, but at the beginning it was, we walked through uh, Pike Place. I had never been. Mm-hmm. It was a lovely uh, little area and tucked away kind of down this cool little street is this bar, which we were the first people in, but uh, <laughs> it started to pick up. We got there right when it opened, and then by the time we left, there was a nice crowd of people there. Oh, yeah, and I can only, and we were there on a weekday afternoon, mm-hmm. so I can only imagine how it's hopping at night. And right. Not only hopping with the living patrons, but with those from beyond the grave. Yes. Yeah. Well, I said we were the first ones there. Probably not, though. There were probably. <laughs> some people. There was another, leave. yeah, there was some a group there that we just didn't see at the time. But, yeah, we did some of our own paranormal investigation, which we'll tell you guys about, too. Very scientific. <laughs> exactly. It can't be debunked. <laughs> There's no very, explanation. But there were some some creepy findings. So, yeah, well, thank you to everyone that came out to this show and, and heard it live. It was so much fun. We had such a fun time at the meet and greet afterwards. Met so many amazing people. Some of you guys gave us gifts. So nice. And just, like, sharing really personal, vulnerable things with us that just legit touches us. and. We just, uh, we had a really great time. Met a guy that I uh, did not know, but graduated from my high school the same year as me. He was there with his wife. They had moved from Fort Worth for her job. We got to talking and I'm like, where'd you go to high school? Heights. What? Me too. When did you graduate? 97. I was like, what? And of course, everyone's wearing masks. And I'm like, who is this? Do I do I know them? <laughs> like, I did I not because it turns out he graduated a year early, so he was really a grade below me. But mm. what a small world. Such a small world brought together by the the magic of the podcast, I guess. Yes. So we did. We got lots of kind, uh, just people sharing about what the show means to them or how they brought their friend who mm-hmm. either never heard the show or had the one that had introduced them to the show. So 
truly a magical time getting to meet folks and everybody all masked up and masked and safe and but still being able to give us things like gluten free Oreos. Yes. Which, which Michelle gave Heather uh, ate in her Patreon. hotel room for several nights in a row. Almost every time Christy <laughs> popped in my room, I was on the bed with my iPad watching old episodes of Real Housewives going to town on some gluten free mm-hmm. Oreos. So they came in very clutch uh for yes. my late night snacks. So yeah, thanks to everybody. And thanks to the clubs that hosted us, Tacoma yeah. host the Tacoma Hop Comedy Club and Washington and the Helium Comedy Club in Portland, such uh, excellent hosts. They were so friendly and welcoming and made sure our extensive, exclusive writer were met, which was literally, can we have like a Diet Coke? Like, do you mind? <laughs> um, that was, they're like, what are your yeah. demands? And we're um, like, I mean, if, it's, if not, that's water, fine. If it's not too <laughs> we much trouble. <laughs> we have room temperature water in our bag. <laughs> but everyone was so nice. And uh, man, those metal straws at Helium Comedy Club. Amazing. Never forget. I took one sip and I go, oh. This makes the Diet Coke taste so much better. Like I'm gonna, colder. Yes, like colder and more refreshing. It was it was delicious. Yeah. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, well, you. we will have the audio for the Portland show. So we'll get that out to you guys uh next week or the week after, depending on, on when we get it. But that was also a super fun show. So for now, let's um let's talk about Kell's Irish pub and the Haunted history. Some call it the most haunted bar in America. <laughs> well, long before it served up Seattle's finest Irish fare, the building housing Kell's Irish Pub at 1916 Post Alley housed a decidedly less lively crowd. Located on the ground floor of the famed Butterworth Building, Kell's wasn't always the cozy establishment where locals wanted to hang out. In fact, to pass through the same doors in 1884, would have meant you weren't there to enjoy the spirits, but rather to become one. Was it at Kells when we started having the great conversation of, what's the deal with history, man? Things have been around for a yeah, long time. Was. Like, <laughs> these walls have just been here. The bricks, the floor, like mm-hmm. the structure itself has seen so much. And to just be able to reach out and put your hand on it, there is something electric, yeah. energy-wise about that. It was there, and like so many things I say, I <laughs> preface with, I am not high right now, because then, <laughs> then like, history's crazy when you think about it, man. But yeah, if you just kind of sit there for a second and picture what it would have looked like back then mm-hmm. with, you know, probably a dirt floor and just the type of clothes that they wore and mm-hmm. horse-drawn carriages coming in with coffins in the back and all sorts of, you know, I mean, just to like imagine that is, it's, is which, uh, which Stephen King, Tommy knockers, where the little things eat up the past. You just imagine mm-hmm. like, that's what it was. And these little things like came and ate it up. And now we are, we're, or if you travel back in time, will you see it? I don't know. I don't know how time works. I don't know how history works. Or is it all happening all at the same time, just on different planes of existence? You know, who, who it's, it's once you've had uh, two Bloody Marys at noon on an empty stomach, you start to wonder <laughs> these things. And I still don't have an answer. Deep thoughts. Mm-hmm. Edgar Ray Butterworth was a cunning businessman. Born in 1847, Massachusetts, Butterworth had been his family's primary breadwinner since the young age of 16. He was a man of many trades, working as a hatter, craftsman, rancher, and even dipping his toe into the legal field for a bit. By 26, he had been married twice and was living in Fort Scott, Kansas. It was here that Butterworth's future would begin to take shape. Kind of get the feeling he was looking for something. He was changing jobs, changing wives, moving cities. Yeah. What was he looking for? His true calling. His yeah. true place in the world. As he traveled across the Kansas plains with his horse and wagon, Butterworth came upon a man grieving the recent loss of his wife and newborn baby. The man desperately wanted to give his family the proper burial they deserved, but lacked the necessary supplies. Using his furniture-making skills, Butterworth made the man a coffin, using wood from his own wagon. It wasn't long before Butterworth saw the business potential in this market and manufactured an entire line of coffins in Olympia, Washington. Taking his success a step further, he then went into the undertaking business. E.R. Butterworth & Sons opened its doors in 1888, according to the many advertisements it ran in area newspapers. It was the first full-service mortuary in the city, and its presence was much needed. 
Prior to Butterworth and Sons going into business, dead bodies would often pile up on the streets of downtown Seattle. It got to be such a problem, in fact, that undertakers were offered $50 by the city for every body they took in. Quickly, Butterworth became a wealthy man. I hope they checked credentials before they started handing out 50s. <laughs> just anybody can go <laughs> grab, um, grab a body. I mean, but what a, again, just, I mean, in today's, in most parts of the, the world now, if bodies were just lying in the street, something would be done about that. But back then it was just... Uh, where, what are we going to do with them? I mean, somebody had to be the first to say, well, why don't we do this with them? And it sounds like, I mean, as far as E.R. Butterworth, he was sort of filling a niche that he didn't even know needed to happen until yeah. all this way, especially until he passed the gentleman on his trip and gave him wood from his own wagon. I mean, if you have those skills, you just go, well, it's sort of like making a chair, but just longer and closed up. Yeah. <laughs> and one that you sit in forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it better be comfortable. Yeah. Sometimes um, opportunity finds you. You know, it just comes knocking and. <laughs> Much, like Much like death. Much like death. Yeah. Business was booming due to the diphtheria epidemic. And by 1903, Butterworth had commissioned a new location near the famous Pike Place Market. He had a vision for his dream mortuary and sought out English architect John Graham, who also designed the Space Needle to bring his vision to life. Designed specifically to handle the influx of bodies, the impressive mortuary stood five stories tall, featured a chapel that sat 200, a crematorium, and a columbarium, a showroom displaying available caskets for purchase, and the very first elevator on the West Coast, according to Curbed Seattle. The latter modern feature wasn't just to impress. It had a very practical purpose, to transport the departed from floor to floor. This is where it helped that we went to visit it because mm -hmm. there's kind of two different addresses because there's an entrance on a higher up street versus the one down in the alley. Um, and so the lower area bar is, you know, one, the where you enter. It's actually now two buildings that have become one. And oddly, being in that other non-Butterworth building, we didn't really feel a lot of energy in no, there. No, that's where the bar was that, that we went into. There's two sides. And we were sitting there and we both kind of said... I don't really, I don't know if it's because we're like the first ones here or what, but we didn't really feel like there was a, a presence or an energy or something. But then independently, we both went to the bathroom, which was on the side where the Butterworth building was. And we peeked around into that bar and we both felt a significant shift mm -hmm. in just the atmosphere. Not, not in a sinister way. In fact, it just felt... Like, uh, there was a presence, but not not one that had harmful intentions. I felt like there was, yeah, something more in the air. And mm -hmm. then later on when we got to meet the owner, he mentioned kind of offhandedly, well, you know, this side wasn't part of the Butterworth building. It mm -hmm. just got attached later. And that's when we were like, oh, that's, why. that's why. But we had both made those comments before and both had those. I said, you know, sitting in the bathroom, I felt like somebody else was in there and there was not. Mm-hmm. But it didn't seem like, you know, they're not, you know, asking me to spare a square. It wasn't like a disruptive I did not feel ghost. scared or anything. No, it wasn't disruptive. Yeah. It just was like, someone, someone's around here. Hey. But. Yeah. For two decades, Seattle residents of all means mourned their loved ones at Butterworth and Sons. The savvy businessman conceptualized the idea of funerals as we know them today, even coining the phrases mortuary and mortician. Well, there ain't nothing like being the first. And also... Uh, the first and something that hasn't changed that much, you know, like we talked it about in the show. In. Yeah, we said even, I mean, people kind of laid out their dead. That's just what a wake is. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sh the the things we have to maybe preserve bodies have advanced, I imagine. Mm -hmm. But the ritual of it all and kind of celebration is kind of the same. Yeah, I think so. And he... And one could say, I mean, funeral homes are uh, they are overseen partially by the Federal Trade Commission to make sure there aren't unscrupulous business practices because it is such a vulnerable time for people. And a lot of times like this, it may be, you know, one of the only providers of those services in a market. And when you think about it early on, Butterworth set it up to be it was not just, OK, give us the body and we'll take care of it and we'll leave. It's like first you need a wake. 
Then you mm-hmm. have to have flowers. Then we're going to have a service. You have to hire a choir. So all this stuff starts getting added onto it. And he's the one that coined that. And when you look at his past career, he this guy's a businessman. Oh, yeah. He's just like trying to find the, the money maker. And it's like, well, what else can we add on? Yeah. You need a choir? Guess what? I ha- I happen to know 10 people that sing beautifully <laughs> together. Yeah. I mean, he did I not. I conduct them. He did not put anything out there that he didn't already have the means to provide. He was ready. He was like ready. A true to like, you need man. this. Mm-hmm. And by the way, I have it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Business was lucrative for Butterworth. As Seattle saw a high death toll owing to violent crime, disease, and the prevalence of nearby mines. Mining incidents occurred frequently, as did larger scale disasters, driving up the demand for an undertaker. Possibly in an effort to double dip on the industry, in 1905, Butterworth invested in the Conrad Consolidated Mining Company, ensuring nearby mining operations would continue while making himself available to process the bodies of any workers who didn't make it back to the surface. That is a have your cake and eat it too, Whoa. man. Whoa. I mean, if it wasn't so diabolical, bad respect to the business side of that. But yeah. that's, yikes. You're like, I'll keep you alive so you could die. Yes, please go down into the mining operations. No, we haven't been licensed by the state. <laughs> like, he's very, uh, very crafty, mm-hmm. crafty with his uh, investments. You know, when I was searching through the old newspapers, it was a ton of advertisements for ER, Butterworth and Sons, mortuary, morticians, cremation, just ad after ad. And then this article said, a new company has been formed. It's a mining company and 10,000 shares are owned by ER Butterworth and... Looked up the mining company, eventually got shut down, went bankrupt. Uh, so it was a short-term play, but nonetheless connected to his mm-hmm. uh, his primary business. Man, mining is is a Dangerous. whole thing. Yeah. That's mad respect to people that are like, I'm just going to go underground and uh, just try and get stuff for all you guys up there on the top. Yeah, anytime. I mean... Someone just messaged us today and said they had started listening to the show with episode 13, which is where you should start. Yeah. And said, I cannot imagine being that down, down that low in such a confined space. And I'm sure, you know, mines to an extent get built out, but still there's that ride down that's going to be down a mine shaft Mm -hmm. that I cannot, I don't know that I'd be able to stomach that. No. And if you haven't listened to episode 13, it's all about cave diving. And in that, you have water to contend with yeah, as well. Even worse. You know? But yeah. you can run out of oxygen down yeah, there too. Oh, I guess sure. you get shut in, yep. closed in. But yeah, I don't I don't know that his concern uh, was mm, safety and efficiency of no. the mine. I think it was in money. Mm-hmm. For sure. More grisly were the fates awaiting the miners from Alaska who returned to Seattle, flush with gold. Criminals hid in the shadows, ready to kill them for their riches, and dump their bodies in Elliott Bay, according to the book Cemeteries of Seattle. Butterworth began to accumulate so much wealth that he nearly became a corpse himself. In 1909, police thwarted a plot to murder the undertaker for his money and diamonds. One of the assailants was interviewed by the Seattle Star and laid out the plot. The men planned to ambush Butterworth in the street, and take him out using a gun equipped with a silencer. The 16-year-old accomplice told the paper, I'm glad I'm arrested. I'm glad I'm in jail. Another month and we'd have got Butterworth. He's worth 2000 as he stands on his feet, and he's worth that much to us dead. Lucky for him, Butterworth lived, and his macabre business continued to grow. I mean, this is pre-Miranda warnings, 1909. Not only was this kid yeah. just talking to the cops, but also very freely talking to the newspaper. There was another guy they were going to kill, laid that plot out. I mean, just admission after admission mm. after admission and no adult parent or police, not police, but a court appointed lawyer to stop him. This is completely putting you on the spot, but I have a feeling you're still going to know. <laughs> but what happened to make the Miranda rights come about? Okay, so it was the late 1960s. Okay. And... I mean, pretty much before this, it was this was a radical change, right? So the Fifth Amendment before this, it was basically saying you could not be com- uh, compelled to confess to a crime. Like they couldn't say if you don't confess, then 
that's can you know we're going to hold you in contempt of court um or we're after- not going to let you leave this room until you tell us you did it <laughs> yeah for sure i mean exactly so it's like well why can't i you know why can't i just leave well we're going to hold you in jail until you talk well that they can do that that's criminal contempt but not anymore because your fifth amendment to the constitution restricts prosecutors from using any statements um as evidence until you tell them that they're that the person in custody has a right to an attorney, mm-hmm. has a right to remain silent, and has a right against self-incrimination. And not only does the defendant understand those, but then voluntarily waives them. So that's kind of the the legal implication of it. But it was in the early 60s, um, a guy named Miranda was arrested in Phoenix, Arizona. I knew it was Arizona. I remembered that. And yeah, it was just circumstantial evidence um, that linked him to the kidnapping and rape of an 18-year-old woman um, that was, you know, a week or two before that. And they interrogated him a long time, probably a couple hours, and then had him write a confession. And, it, you know, it said at the bottom of the confession, it said, like, I have a right to counsel. These statements can be used against me. But he said they, they didn't tell them that. And... They he basically allegedly he confessed orally, but that they didn't tell the, him orally and get his confirmation of understanding that he had a right to remain silent and that he didn't have to talk to the police. And so the Supreme Court basically said a full voluntary confession is only valid whenever somebody has been informed of their rights and has said, yes, I understand these rights, and yes, I am voluntarily waiving them. And if not, then the statement is inadmissible. Mm. So that was pretty much the crux of it was that his case was overturned because they had admitted his statements that he had made with not all the, basically what you now know is, you know, on law and order or whatever, Mm -hmm. you have the right to remain silent. Since that wasn't all in there, the Supreme Court overturned his conviction and remanded it back down to Arizona. as a retrial. So they was kind he convicted of convicted eventually. Um, I Did can't he do remember. Um, I think they used other evidence and then he eventually was convicted. Mm. Um, but yeah, there's, you know, it's a case where the underlying crime, I think it's heinous and he should have gone to jail, but also we need to protect everybody's constitutional rights. Mm-hmm. So, in the cases where you are not <laughs> guilty of right. this. Um, and he was still able to be convicted based on other evidence. They didn't need that coerced confession or, you know, not even coerced, but I guess not totally voluntary confession. So it's something that, you know, we always say you don't want your name at the top of a textbook. So mm-hmm. that's kind of why I guess he, I mean, he made an impact, unfortunately, on the victim who he attacked, but then also on, you know, future suspects, both those who are guilty and those who are are not so Mm -hmm. it's a big deal i saw a new law and order is coming out with elliot stabler so i'm sure we'll hear it it's called law and order um it's a A new a new iteration yeah so iteration yeah uh, yeah, there's gonna be svu but then there's now law and order oh it's like uh organized crime oh i think Elliot Stabler versus the mob. Nice, nice. Well, thank you for that explanation. I mean, it's all rusty, but hopefully. (laughs) (laughs) Vague remembrance slash Wikipedia. (laughs) Sinisterhood will be right back. Growing up, cereal was one of my favorite parts about being a kid, but I have all kinds of stomach issues that are tied to gluten, so my uh, cereal pickings are slim, but Magic Spoon came into my life. It has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only 4 net grams of carbs in each serving. It's also only 140 calories a serving. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. Plus, there's a variety pack that includes four flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. I had the peanut butter today, and I gotta say, very pleasantly surprised. It was a great peanut butter flavor. It kept its crunchiness to the very last drop of milk it didn't get soggy or anything it was it was quite delicious and then you told me a little pro tip you get that peanut butter you mix in some of the cocoa tastes yes, like it tastes like a certain type of chocolate peanut butter candy that we all like it tastes just like regular cereal in the cereal version of the candy that we like mm-hmm. from your childhood but it's super nutritious it's delicious but super healthy cereal that brings joy to your mornings or afternoons or for me 
evening. I mixed chocolate and peanut butter for dinner tonight. I had a little oat milk on it. And it was just a fun treat, but also it was filling because of all the protein. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not going to be all jacked up on sugar so I can sleep at a reasonable hour as well. Go to magicspoon.com slash Sinisterhood to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code Sinisterhood at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. But why would you ever send back that chocolatey peanut buttery mm. goodness? Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash Sinisterhood and use code Sinisterhood to save $5 off. Simply Safe just launched their new wireless outdoor security camera. That's right, Simply Safe, the system that U.S. News and World Report names the best home security system of 2021, just got even better. This brand new outdoor security camera is engineered with all the advanced tech and security features you want and need to keep you and your family safe. It has ultra-wide 140-degree field of view, so you can keep watch over your entire yard. It has 1080p HD resolution with an 8x zoom. That means you can zoom in and clearly see things like faces and license plates to capture critical evidence. It also has a built-in spotlight with color night vision, so you can keep an eye on what's going on day and night. It's super simple to set up and usually just takes a couple of minutes. And it has an easy-to-remove rechargeable battery, so it doesn't need an outlet and can go anywhere on your property. This camera has it all, and it integrates with your Simply Safe home security system, extending its protection to the outside. Together, it means every door, window, and room are protected, and now your property will be too. To learn more about the exciting new Simply Safe wireless outdoor security camera, visit simplysafe.com/creepy. What's more, Simply Safe is celebrating this new camera by offering 20% off your entire new system and your first month of monitoring service for free when you enroll in interactive monitoring. Again, that's simplysafe.com slash creepy. With HelloFresh, you get fresh, pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh offers 50 menu and market items to choose from every week, from vegetarian meals and calorie smart choices to extra special gourmet options. There's something for everyone to enjoy, with recipes designed and tested by professional chefs and nutritional experts to ensure deliciousness and simplicity. Fall is busy, especially with us. We're going on tour, traveling in and out of town, but HelloFresh recipes save time we would otherwise spend meal planning, shopping, chopping, so we can all get back to what matters. We can also easily customize orders on the app within minutes. You can change your delivery day, food preferences, and plan size, or skip a week whenever you need to. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Creepy14 and use code Creepy14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. Again, get up to 14 free meals, including free shipping at HelloFresh.com slash Creepy14. And use code CREEPY14, America's number one meal kit. Unbeknownst to Butterworth's customers, their undertaker didn't conduct his death care business with the honor and respect they expected. In 1903, Butterworth and two local doctors were sued by a widow for their role in mutilating her husband's corpse. After her husband's untimely death, the doctors requested the woman's permission to perform an autopsy. She refused but the doctors ignored her wishes, according to her suit. Unknown to her, the two doctors went into Butterworth's morgue and cut up the body in a frightful manner. She sued for $2,500 in damages, about $77,000 in today's money. I'm not trying to besmirch Butterworth, but I feel like if you just gave him some bucks and told him just look the other way, he'd be like, I didn't see nothing. Mm -hmm. That is definitely what, it's, what it sounds like. I got a morgue and you can use it. In 1913, another grieving widow sued Butterworth, claiming he overcharged her for her husband's funeral. She told the court Butterworth put her husband in a coffin so large it wouldn't fit through the door and had to be hauled out through a window, despite her husband's small frame, according to the Tacoma Daily Ledger. You think she charged him a window fee? <laughs> or he charged her a window fee? What? <laughs> That's like when my uh, parents bought me a swing set when I was little and my dad and my grandpa put it together in the garage 
And then they realized this doesn't fit out the garage, and they had to take apart, take the whole oh. thing apart, and then go oh, redo it's it. Like a ship in a bottle. Yes, out in the backyard. Like you got to make sure wherever you, the the intended destination for this thing is, you can get it there without having to like do something wild, going out windows and stuff. Somehow, at a my first apartment when I moved back to Dallas from Chicago, I got a couch into it. But when it came time to move it, there was zero percent chance of getting it. We could not get it out, and we had because just my brother, the angles to turn it and stuff. It must have been again. We were stumped, fully perplexed <laughs> because it got in there somehow, and we hadn't assembled. It wasn't like an IKEA couch, or it wasn't like a you know a sectional a modular. Mm -hmm. It was a big long sofa. It was purple velvet. It was real nice. sweet, <laughs> and I didn't want to cram it against the wall because the you know you don't want to rip the velvet off. It was on the second story, so my dad, my brother in law, Aaron had to put ropes on it and ultimately like pulley it over the balcony <laughs> wow. down into some bushes. It was pretty epic i'm pretty sure michael <laughs> missy's husband was there as well it was this like whole catastrophe and of course people start you know an apartment complex everybody starts watching like can they oh, do yeah. it can they can do they it do we did rooting it for you yeah we saved we saved the barney couch <laughs> nice whatever happened to it oh man i used that thing until the bottom fell out of it oh, uh, wow. it was actually it used to be my sister's couch it was freaking sweet couch man it was purple it was good looking i wish i still had it i put it in the studio because it is very much our vibe it was oh, like yeah. a dark purple uh but yeah that's I'm one of the ones it. where having hauled a couch out the window and we could kind of tump it on any direction that's yeah. fine a tiny body in a giant <laughs> casket nah. there's gonna be some rattling situation that's like there's when be uh when we were driving from Tacoma to Portland, and the suitcases kept rattling around in the back <laughs> of the car. And I said, Tommy was in the back, and I was like, babe, can you turn around and, and make those stop? And he goes, no. And that was it. And I was like, are you being for real? He's like, there's nowhere. I can't lay him down. Well, we pulled over to get gas, and Heather... <laughs> Heather figured it out pretty fast. <laughs> I like to say I'm I'm good with Tetrising things in. You did. That, I can kind of fit and wedge things, but it was the sound. It was almost like a cartoon or like <laughs> it was like a TV show because it was like every time I turned the wheel, broom, <laughs> broom, yeah. it would fall to the other side and you just very softly just like, oh, do you think you can move those? And with a straight face, Tommy went, no. <laughs> and then I turned to get on the highway and it was like, Brrr. yeah, we had a lot uh, of antics. We had a lot of antics on the trip. We did. We did have a lot. Of, that it was, was a lot of fun. We, we stopped off at a gas station, left Tommy. Uh, <laughs> his dad was coming. Because he wanted to be left, not because of the suitcase situation. <laughs> no, it's not. But we did manage to, uh, we bought a skull with a Viking hat on it. Yes, it was great. we did. We got matching wolf shirts. Yes. Truck oh, stop wolf, wolf shirts. Packs. Yes. Wolf pack. Yeah, the the uh, skull will now be coming with this to the live show. So you'll get if you're to coming it. to Denver, Salt Lake, or any of in, the ones in Texas. You will get to see it. It is yet to be named. Perhaps yeah, it's named name. by the next show. Yeah, we got to find know. a name for it. Yeah. But it'll come was, organically. It will. Can't We're not force gonna, it. I don't want to force it. Mm -mm. You see that skull? You look at it. And you can't force anything on that no. skull. No. Nah. Because uh, there's a sticker on the bottom that says it has carcinogens in it. So <laughs> awesome. Great. <laughs> Yeah, well, after I don't we, know what it's made out after of. After we spent like, a lot of time in a hotel room and the car with it, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it's made out of either. Mm. D yeah, it just tells us that it those are in it, but not why. Yeah, it says there's dangerous chemicals in this in the state of California. I was like, I think those chemicals are dangerous everywhere. <laughs> not just not just here. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know how science works, but I don't think it's only in one state. No, I don't think you cross the border and it's like, oh, these are <laughs> these won't kill you here. Only uh, over there. <laughs> Except for if you cross the border into Oregon, and then electric lettuce is everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Suddenly it's all shout safe out up to there. electric lettuce, you guys. Good, good establishment. Nice establishment quite a time. there. Yes, quite a time. Will still Butterworth's business continue to boom with the 1918 Spanish influenza outbreak bringing in even more customers? According to the Influenza Encyclopedia, over 1,400 Seattle residents died of influenza in the six months between September 1918 and February of 1919, and the one man who processed most of the victims was Butterworth himself. Some of these photographs in the Yes, It's a Thing Influenza Encyclopedia mm -hmm. show all these folks wearing cloth masks. Yep. It's, and This has been a thing for a minute, y'all. 
Yeah, I was like, I don't think this was just invented, despite what memes from that guy that sat behind me in math class in 10th grade is posting. <laughs> no. Like, it seems to be. Yeah. We've had pandemics before. There have been uh, vaccines before and masks before. I don't know about social distancing. The hand washing has probably improved. But I would say yes. But uh, so back then, people just stuck their fingers in folks for surgeries. There was mm, just nothing. Yeah, there was or no, you just poured some st- vodka straight up on your hands. <laughs> a little bit in the in. mouth, a little bit on the <laughs> wound. Uh, Gave a little yeah, bit to the know. person going under, just in case. Yeah, rub it on their gums. <laughs> also to the babies. That's yeah. right. Stop yeah, crying but real some fast. things are the same. You know, yeah. the like the masks. <laughs> well, all those bodies were too tempting for Butterworth. And the business soon found itself facing federal criminal charges. The government alleged the undertaker had been scamming the loved ones of the fallen Navy service members and double dipping on their funeral bills. After collecting his $100 from the government for each body, Butterworth would then charge the mourning families for the same services. It was also said Butterworth was willing to process any body that came through the door for the right price, even when the causes of death were suspicious. This mean, man. I mean, these people have lost their loved ones. Mm-hmm. And you're just... He was he was without scruples. He was scrupulous. Yes. That's right. Mm-hmm. Dr. Linda Hazard called herself doctor. However, she was not actually formally trained as a doctor, nor did she hold a medical degree, according to Smithsonian Magazine. Instead, she was licensed by the state as a... Fasting specialist. Hazard believed she could treat disease with starvation. In particular, she recommended extreme liquid diets and frequent enemas to her patients, in many cases leading to their deaths. The photographs of these people that she treated, Mm. oh, it's bad. I mean, they're skin and bones. Yeah. If anybody could kind of just say they were anything back then, you know? Nobody. They didn't have the credentials framed on the wall, and even if they did, they could be made up. You couldn't Google them. There was no database. And when you're desperate and (gasps) you're... so sick and need help i mean you're willing to try anything you know and unfortunately you were just a guinea pig or worse even just like somebody's twisted and morbid project yeah and they found some of her records that she kept on people and it's indisputable i mean she would tell them they could have a cup of broth twice a day and three enemas Mm. and what that does to your body it's, oh, I mean, just, I mean, ravages. Yeah, you're putting in liquid just to take liquid out. You're just, you know, you're dehydrated. You're you're not absorbing any nutrients or anything. Plus, on top of that, they're sick, and whatever they're sick with is not getting treated. Yes, you know, yeah, they may have had too. cancer or heart disease or something. It's only going to make it worse. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she was. She uh, she, she was a hazard. That, that doctor term. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yes. Well, Hazard found a willing partner in Butterworth and someone who could help her cover her crimes. In an effort to help Hazard avoid prosecution, Butterworth would quickly cremate her victims, destroying any potential evidence of wrongdoing. In one case, upon Butterworth cremating one of Hazard's emaciated victims, the two worked together to choose a similar, healthier-looking corpse to show to the victim's family. The ruse didn't work, and Hazard was eventually convicted of first-degree murder. She was sentenced to hard labor, though she was eventually pardoned. The audacity to oh. roll in a switcheroo corpse Yikes. and think that it would work. No. Yeah. You're, no no mortician is that good. You're not going to make somebody no. look like a different person just with all the makeup and a wig or whatever. That's, yeah, that's so, you're, and then you're just being gaslit. You're like, well, that doesn't look like Susan, but surely it has to be Susan. You're, you're like, nobody would actually no. switch a body and Certainly lie to me. It's like. They would. They would, and they did. Yeah. Yeah. This pair. Butterworth died in 1921, but his funeral wasn't held at the building he had built for that purpose. Instead, it was held at his home on Queen Anne, according to Seattle Met. The company ER built lived on until 1991, when his descendants sold it to a national chain from New Orleans. The building is now home to Kell's Irish Pub, opened by the McAleese family in 1983. What does that say about his opinion of his own building that he's like, mm-hmm. when I go, don't fucking take me there. No. Don't you take me there. I would like to go back to Queen Anne. We got some Queen Anne coffee. 
from mm-hmm. a listener at the show. And Tommy today, he goes, we got to get a grinder. We can't grind these beans. Oh, I got a good bean grinder. You got a good I like one? To make, I, got, I like to make French press coffee, and Paris makes cold brew, so... See, Tommy said. Tommy said he liked cold brew. They got to get the yeah, Brown Brothers got to get cold together. Brew, but he was Nitro. also doing French press for a while. But he wasn't grinding the beans himself. Can okay, you do a yeah. French press without grinding the beans? Well, you can get them to grind them at wherever you buy that's the beans. Must be, yeah, like that's at, what well, you would do. Whole Foods or Starbucks yeah. or the grocery store or whatever they have bean grinders there. Is the French but, press where it's just the glass thing and you like pour the water over? Yeah, and then you push it down. You mash yeah. it down. Yeah, he mm-hmm. did that for a minute. Yeah. Yeah, he said he liked nitro cold brew, and I was like, Paris got nitro canisters from the internet, and he nitro oh, yes. his own cold brew. It's very impressive. What He's does very nitro dedicated. mean? It, like, shoots it out with nitrous nitrogen. I don't Y'all talk shit oxide. to me about saying Aragon instead of Argon beam, so I stay away from science terms. I stay <laughs> in my own oxide? lane. I, it probably is it the stuff that you put in cars to make it go fast on Grand Theft Auto? I think it's that nitrous, stuff. I don't know if nit- what uh, nitrous oxide is, but I'm assuming this is the stuff you put in whipped cream. Yes, yes, yes. It's that. Yeah, okay. Maybe, it, I don't so, know if that's nitrous oxide or not. He has like some canister that he got and he sticks the little canister, or he sticks the nitro canisters on it and then pushes a button and it shoots the coffee out. And because it has that nitro part of it, it makes it cold. Oh, and okay. it kind of so froths it's all to it make up. it cold. Mm-hmm. It's like what they do at Starbucks, where they have the the canisters under there, and they it shoots it out. So it's not just like coffee with ice. You don't have to put ice in it. Gotcha. Yeah, these uh, back in the back in a different time, Christy used to have some fun with those called Did you whippets. Whip it? Oh yes, I, I heard. Oh, that's whips. I was like on the Blues Brothers. He's like orange whip, orange whip. But I have heard of whippets. Who was mm-hmm. it? Maybe it was some, it was like a teen rapper on the internet. Probably. It was, was a very, like, t- stupid young person thing to do. Yeah. Well, we no whippets at the McKinney Brown No, it's not but... having, it's all for coffee. Yes. It's only coffee. That's mm-hmm. how you know you've, you've reached your mid-30s. <laughs> yeah. Where you're like, don't waste those on a whippet. I have to make my cold brew. <laughs> I can't wake up without my cold brew in the morning. <laughs> well, called the most haunted bar in America. By ghostly activities, Kells is located in what was once a funeral wagon garage, meaning every deceased body that entered the mortuary passed through the same door patrons now walk through for their favorite pint. According to the Corvallis Gazette Times, a shaman once counted 19 fully formed ghosts in the building, which also sits on the site of a burial ground, sacred to the Suquamish, sacred to the Suquamish people. Mercedes Yeager, a local ghost tour guide, told the Gazette, There are some pissed off ghosts in there. Well, I imagine. Well, you, you know. A lot of stuff happened in there. And then, you know, whenever you're on top of a sacred burial ground, that's not a good recipe for anything if poltergeist taught us anything. Uh, that is true, too. And yeah, when you realize that it wasn't just, well, this is a one off room that was sometimes used, it was every. Can maybe possibly died suddenly, confused spirit passed through a room. That might mm-hmm. be where they feel more attached to. Mm-hmm. The current owners are considerate of their ghastly co-tenants. Though they report increased incidence of paranormal activity during times of construction, they continue to develop and improve the space. The McAleese family began renovating the chapel in 2005 and maintained respect for the space's past. Owner Patrick told the Corvallis Gazette, I'd never ignore the past of this place. Going so far as to enlisting the help of Father Tony, a priest friend, to bless the space. And yeah, 2005 is when he said that he had the most spine-tingling encounter of all, and that's when the real renovation started, Mm -hmm. was on Thanksgiving night. Ooh, regale us with that story, Heather. um, He went to meet a couple of friends, and they were going to just meet up at the bar and then leave and go have dinner and he said that they got there before him, and he was planning on just coming, meeting them, locking up the place, and leaving. And he said it was two different friends from two separate areas of his life, and they were all going to, it's what Thanksgiving is made for, right? Mm-hmm. Is everybody getting together? And he said that they both were sitting there, and they noticed that someone was working in the kitchen, which they thought was weird because it was Thanksgiving. And when Patrick arrived, he said that they, they asked him, oh, are you open? And he said, no, it's Thanksgiving. I was waiting for you guys. And they said, well, who's that redheaded woman in the kitchen we saw? And all the lights had been turned on and they had 
both seen a fully formed redheaded woman walking in the kitchen. So he said a, a, a tingle shot down his spine. And later when he spoke with his sister, who'd also you know spent a ton of time in the space, she said, oh, you're talking about the redheaded lady? <laughs> so mm. it is a, a pretty, uh, I guess it's a busybody spirit. She was in there cooking. <laughs> So I guess on Thanksgiving, you know what? She, she, had like, a, she had a turkey to make. Yeah, yeah of course. Like, Please don't turn the lights off. I'm making Thanksgiving dinner. But <laughs> there you can tell that Patrick and his wife, um, Olivia, are extremely so nice, thoughtful too. and consider oh. and also just consider and respectful of the history of the place mm-hmm. as well. And understanding that it has a rich history, that people are interested in it and not they don't, you know, say, oh, get out of here. Don't talk about it. they're like, oh, yeah, well, these are our experiences mm-hmm. and this is what most people think. And. Um, being very, you know, understanding that maybe not the best of times were spent there in the early 1800s, but they are now because it's a family business that's been mm-hmm. around for, you know, 20, 28, 30 years. So they're, they, they have a cute little daughter too. And you can tell they just, they love the place and it does the parts that do feel energetic and spiritual. I felt like they felt almost homey. Mm-hmm. Like the one side we were on was totally great restaurant welcoming. But when we went to that more spiritual side and I, maybe it was just because we were with them. But it felt like bustling, almost like a house with people in it, but it was totally empty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We also got a tour of uh, the various floors and where the chapel was, and they're now renovating it and turning it into like a swanky kind of club, which looked very cool. That's a gorgeous view of the water, which it's Patrick beautiful. said at one point was... Um, bricked over and was the broom closet because I guess people back then did not care about views. <laughs> they were like, water is water. Who cares? It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, and then also uh, she told us about a corner in the second floor mm-hmm. that it's kind of the banquet area. You can have private parties up there that no matter how much light is in the area, it's always dark. And that some paranormal researchers took a photo and they saw a person whose mouth was sewn shut standing over back in that corner, almost like a corpse that had been treated by Butterworth. And she said that's the only place in the whole establishment that gives her the heebie-jeebies that she doesn't like to go near. Which it was. I mean, when we walked past it, it there... It was dark. There's, yeah, it was a dark corner, mm-hmm. despite having, you know, a full wall of lights on one side. But mm-hmm. I do, I like how they've renovated and they've kept a lot of features that that ornate look you know, between the two, because they bought, you know, the the building next to it. They mm-hmm. have a space over there as well. So there's like a big barn door that they kept from one of, the, you know, from, from the original building and in the chapel, the wood carving. So you can still, even though it is an upscale nightclub or well on its way to becoming an upscale nightclub, the wood carving, you can still see of like, oh, this did used to be a more, mm-hmm. you know, kind of a religious space. So it's very, it's, I, I like the keeping a toe in the past while going into the future as yep. well. Yeah, and they said their daughter, who I believe she was 18 months, so sweet, ever since she was even littler, kind of would be very animated on this one staircase, and that was always kind of the place she gravitated towards and would sit, and it almost looked like she was talking to something, and they say kids are more open to stuff because they haven't learned to be cynical yet. They can see things that that we can't, so... And she did go and sit on it at one point while we were there, too. You know? They they know things we don't. They do. All sorts of things we don't. Sinisterhood will be right back. By now, pretty much everyone has heard of CBD, and if there was ever a time to get started with CBD, it is now. What both scientists and those who use CBD regularly know is that it helps with daily stresses, but you have to use a quality product to get quality results. Charlotte's Web hemp extracts are tested 20 plus times from seed to final product. Unlike many companies, Charlotte's Web has their own proprietary hemp genetics, so the end products are consistent, meaning you know what to expect from each bottle. And they're a mission driven B Corp, which just means that they promise to help the planet and humanity and all that good stuff. Hey, I mean, we're on a weird time zone right now. Yeah. Uh, we were just two hours in the future or the past. I don't even know how time zones work. But I can always rely on my Charlotte's Web Sleepy Time gummies. They have melatonin and CBD, so they can help me fall asleep and have a restful night's sleep. Um, And I feel totally fine, ready to go in the morning and uh, ready to wake up and conquer the day. Mm -hmm. Yes, Uh, the Calm gummies also help help me sleep. And such a lovely lemon-lime flavor, too. They've definitely helped me get back 
into the swing of things, kind of. I'm still dragging ass. I've been dragging ass all day, but it's not. But the gummies have, have have helped for sure. Yeah, and it's, it's only ass. two hours, and I'm dragging ass. Also, it's just you know when you're we were frazzled on the tour, and now we at least can turn to Charlotte's Web to help us keep exactly. calm uh, back in our regular routine. You can keep calm and get in your regular routine. Go to charlottesweb.com. Get started with the OG CBD brand who kicked off this whole CBD craze and use code CREEPY at checkout to save 15% on your order. This code works on all CBD products besides bulk bundles. That's charlottesweb.com. Use code CREEPY to save 15% on your order. Y'all know I don't have a cat in my house, but I do have a cat in my heart. His name is Fred. (laughs) He lives with my mom. I love to visit him, but he doesn't love me so much. So it's really Uh kind of a one-sided love. He's just a scaredy cat. He's a fraidy cat. He's picky. He's kind of bitchy. He sounds like he has a lot in common with you. I know that maybe that's what it is. Scaredy cat, picky, not bitchy though. I mean, a little bit. But he who (laughs) isn't? But I mean, I love him so much, and I want him to stay safe. He, I got him my freshman year of college, and he is still kicking all these years later. And so I do worry about his health. And nothing is more important. And so that's why I make sure that he gets to use Pretty Litter. And the fact that Pretty Litter changes color to help detect early signs of potential illness in your cat, including urinary tract infections and kidney disease, is amazing. Well, and Fred always hides under the bed. So you, I mean, he's always hiding somewhere under, my mom has a little trampoline she jumps on. He'll hide under there. So it's hard to assess his health, frankly, because he's a, he's a phantom of the night. But (laughs) Uh, with that pretty litter, if you can see the different colors, he's mm-hmm. you know we'll be able to know to take him to the vet. And also, it has made litter box cleanup so much easier for my dear mother. Its ultra absorbent crystals trap the odor and instantly and last up to a month. Plus, pretty litter is safer for your cat and for the whole household. Many conventional litters contain irritants that can aggravate allergies and asthma, but pretty litter's super light crystal base minimizes mess and dust. And Pretty Litter arrives safely at your door in a small, lightweight bag, which is great for my mom. She doesn't have to lug a giant thing of cat litter across the grocery store. Plus, shipping is free, and, you know, Nathan McKinney loves free. And we don't have to worry about her trying to store bulking containers uh, and, and taking up room in the house. Love is putting your cat's health first with Pretty Litter. Do what we did and make the switch today by visiting prettylitter.com. Use promo code CREEPY for 20% off your first order. That's prettylitter.com, promo code creepy for 20% off. Prettylitter.com, promo code creepy. The owners of Kell's Pub weren't the only ones to experience supernatural events. Opened in 1997, Cafe Sophie, a restaurant and club, was neighbor to Kell's and used to occupy what is now part of its space. Owners Scott and Sue Craig designated one booth, the haunted booth after several customers reported similar eerie feelings in the same spot. According to the Corvallis Gazette, a pair of customers goaded the spirits in the booth one night, denying their existence and demanding they show themselves. Soon, their demands were answered by a giant chunk of ceiling that fell down beside them. A ghastly occurrence? Possibly. Then again, Cafe Sophie's owner told the cassette, Turns out there was a problem with the ceiling. Well, you know, it could, it's <laughs> one of the two. It's either a problem <laughs> with the ceiling or an angry ghost. But, or you both. know, don't piss off the ghost. <laughs> I know, don't go with the ghost. I would Mm-mm. say, you know, if it was a problem with the ceiling, that was just an in route for the ghost to use that and kind of flick it. Instead of having to use mm-hmm. a bunch of energy to push a booth over or, like, flip the table over to show them, they could just, you know... It was already, uh, you know, hanging on by a thread. They could just snip that thread and show mm-hmm. that their power is real. Also, don't don't admit to the ceiling falling down on people. That's dangerous. Could you, to the insurance adjuster, say, <laughs> and I'm being for real, could you say this history has a, I mean, we kind of covered this on the Judge, Judge Christie once. Mm-hmm. Like, this has a history of being a haunted establishment. Here's the proof. We think that a ghost did this. What? I mean, I think that would be up to the insurance company policies as to what they would accept as proof. I think that's what Judge Christie decided as well. That <laughs> I it's, think so. That, yeah, you can't, you'd have to have a clause in there that somehow worded it to where you could imply that a ghost was responsible for the damage. 
I wonder too, if as a business owner, you would not, I mean, because it isn't something that can be proven, it's not going to really raise rates. But if for some reason the insurance company goes, oh, okay, well, it's haunted and they, the ghosts push things off the walls and, you know, break glass, we think that that's extra dangerous. So we're going to ins- <laughs> raise your insurance rates. Dang. Well, if they can raise it for ghosts, then they have to accept the they claim, have to pay the it ghost out. claims. Yeah. That's you can't, right. you a- can't have it one way or the other. You got to pay out that claim. Yes. But structural problems couldn't explain all the goings-on. Subsequent owners reported wine bottles flying off the racks toward an employee's head, glasses of alcohol flying off the bar, and mirrors and artwork falling to the ground and shattering. On one occasion, when the McAleese family ran toward the sound of shattered glass, they found a mirror broken, its pieces neatly stacked in a pile. Beside the pile, a single candle was lit and burning on the bar, according to the Gazette. Patrick McAleese told the paper, You think someone must be pulling your leg, but then you don't see anyone. Karen McAleese, Patrick's sister, told the Seattle Times she has also witnessed an unexplainable phenomenon. One of her most memorable encounters occurred on All Saints Day in 2005 in the pub's kitchen. Karen told the Times that out of nowhere, a figure appeared. He was a tall man who looked like he was part black with a suit jacket on. He had very thin hands. He walked to the end of the bar and just kind of faded. See, there it goes in 2005 again. That's when the chapel, Mm -hmm. real construction on the chapel started. And that was when Thanksgiving incident occurred, too, with Patrick. So they were stirring stirring stuff up, on Uh, not on purpose, but on accident, just as as a byproduct of the construction. Much like me, ghosts don't like change. And (laughs) when things start to change, they, you know, it's, it's the environment that they were used to. True. Maybe they're, they're not even. To. They're not even mad. They're literally just lost because the, yeah. the walls are different. We're like knocking stuff <laughs> or the over. D- they're like the I'm door sorry. has changed. They're like I don't know how to get out now. Yeah. They're like I did not mean to knock that mirror off, but I was walking through and I accidentally <laughs> knocked it down because that wall wasn't normally there. Yes. I was very confused. There are a number of frequently seen ghastly patrons around the pub. These include a young redheaded girl described as shy who carries around a ragged teddy bear. Those that have encountered her say she has a mischievous personality and loves coming out to meet younger visitors. She's even been known to make ragdolls for the children that visit the pub during the day with their families. Well, we downloaded three ghost hunting apps (laughs) while we we were there. One of them, and we will link them all in the show notes because off the top of my head, I cannot remember the names, but a lot of people asked us after the live show what they were, so we will make sure to let everyone we'll know. So well, the can... first one was I ovul- ovulus. Was this the one that said... Words. Words? So okay. this one, I was in the side that Christy and I started in, and of course, my I didn't have good service because it's a basement of a brick building from the 1900s. So I walked towards the front of the building, get service, and download this app. It was listed on Bustle's top 11 <laughs> apps you should use to ghost hunt. So that's where my sources were. <laughs> and so I went to download it. And when I finally did, it was showing up red, which means no messages. And then I walked over to the other side of the bar, which would have been in the Butterworth building in that carriage area. And on the handheld paranormal device, the eye ovulus, the word coffin popped up, mm. which supposedly means that the spirits around me were trying to communicate. And that's the word that they said. Very um, specific word. Of course, yes. I am my uh, doubting ass immediately was like, it knows our location. It's just <laughs> geotargeting where we are. I was like, it actually does not have very good service. So I don't maybe it did, but. Or, you know, you never know. Maybe it was just a coincidence. But I saw that it said coffin. I freaked out and started screaming and ran through the bar back towards Christy and was breathing heavily. And I was was like, like, what's happening? What's happening? (laughs) What was the one that it would tell you what type? It would say spirit detected or presence Mm -hmm. detected. And then it would tell you um, the type, like a man, child, kind of their... Uh, demeanor, their mm-hmm. color of their yep. aura, also their horoscope sign, which is very helpful. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. But That's accurate. Yeah, there it's called was Ghostcom Radar. Ghostcom Radar. I like this radar. one a lot. And it, yep, said, it said spirit type, 
child. child. And it said that, and words will kind of appear, and it said the child was scared. Mm -hmm. And I (laughs) tried to get the child to interact with me. Heather was like, Chrissy's a mom. She'll she'll go hug her. And I was like, please, child. And I held out my hands. Unfortunately, (laughs) the child did not come to me. But it was, again, very interesting that that was supposed to, that's one of the ones that everyone uh, recalls that they see. And that's also the room where the stairwell that their Patrick and Olivia's little girl would always go to that supposedly the child would, would be on. So... It's true. And we did another one of the ghost com spirits that were detected was a male that was confused. And that sounds like what uh, Karen saw when she said she saw the man kind of walk around confused Mm -hmm. and wander out. Mm -hmm. I mean, a confused male. It could just be that he was like this fucking construction. Where am I going? (laughs) Um, And there was another male that was content. So we had we had a couple of. Possible oh. encounters if you go off of the bustle top eleven episodes. Too much. With. Couldn't do it in ten. Had to do it in eleven. No, nope, there's that one extra one. Mm-hmm. According to ghostly activities, an even merrier spirit is known as Charlie, a dapper gentleman who likes to manifest in the Guinness Mirror whenever the restaurant hosts live music. Guests recognize him by his derby hat and mirthful demeanor, as they report the feeling of the charming spirit's positive energy as he enjoys the happy crowds. While patrons have reported seeing Charlie in the mirror, when they turn around to get a better look, there's no one there. But when they look back in the mirror, there is Charlie once again. The mirror is not currently on display. It's in a hallway. It's not a hallway. It's a stairwell. But yes. we were able to see it. We, got we did. The, the kind family was able to take us back, and we took a photo, and there was a man behind us. This man was George Brown. It was so mistaken. <laughs> He it happened was. to be with us. But he did have a mirthful demeanor. So He did. He was lovely. And he would have very much enjoyed live music. We had such a lovely time with we George did. on the trip. Oh, such so, a, he's yes. a gem. He's just he's a gem. a gem. Yeah. Um, so it was great that he could experience all that with us. But mm-hmm. yeah, no Charlie. But we did see a George. But that's our George. So you probably won't see him if you go back. The content gentleman on the app, though, maybe that was Charlie. Maybe he was oh, there. That's true. Well, we got three out of the 19... Yes. Then we'll have to go back for the other, the other (laughs) sixteen. Collect them all, Mm -hmm. (laughs) like Pokemon. Other ghosts appear to be not so happy. They have been seen wandering aimlessly and appear gaunt and thin, indicating they could possibly be the victims of Doctor Hazard's evil methods. One patron in a previous business housed in the Betterworth Building even ran out screaming after seeing the ghost of a frail older woman disappear into a wall. Of course, no haunted landmark in the U.S. is safe from the reach of Zach Bagans and the Ghost Adventures team. On their visit to the pub in 2010, Bagans called out to the former owner himself, saying, Hey, E.R. Butterworth, are you in here, buddy? This is where you stored all the caskets, right here, for the business that you ran off of people dying. I don't have a problem with that. We all die. What I do have a problem with is you were involved with a convicted killer. A lady named Dr. Hazard. On an EVP replay, the team allegedly captured a ghastly response, a harsh whisper saying, Get us, Hazard. Hey, our Butterworth, buddy, (laughs) come on out. What you doing? (laughs) Such an odd way to approach a spirit. Are you in here, buddy? Buddy. Yeah. First of all, you don't know me. I, if I'm Butterworth, we ain't buddies. You don't know I'm me. I'm a proprietor of a business, young man, and you're wearing earrings in your ear, and a, your hair is quite tall. Yes. There's way too many chains on your pants and too many, well, I've heard people say bedazzled, but I'm not sure what that means, but it looks like your shirt is bedazzled. Yeah, Your sparkly shirt is distracting to me. I don't uh, think yeah. Butterworth and Bagans would have been buddies. No, I think that was uh, that was a little too familiar to mm-hmm. say, hey, buddy. Mm-hmm. And I do like that he said, you ran your business off of dead people. I mean, that's cool, though. We all got to make a living, <laughs> says the person who hunts ghosts. <laughs> and gets paid a lot of money to do so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and has an entire museum with murderabilia in it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The crew also heard footsteps in the former chapel space, which prompted Bagans to square up, saying, 
Come on, do something. I can hear you walking around. The EVP results captured a spirit, supposedly saying, They have a bomb. Okay, this is where we talked about it in the live show, too. What? The actual what? audio sounds like, blah, 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 blah. But they're like, can you can hear it clearly. They're saying they have a bomb. Probably thinking about, about our cell phones. They're looking at our cell phones. They think that cell phone is a bomb. I was like, the cell phone's not shaped like a bomb. So fully, they don't think that. Like, no. you're, that's not even close. Um, yeah. Didn't make um, any sense. I said they probably were talking about a Jaeger bomb, which yes. makes way more sense than a they, bar. they mistook a cell phone for an actual bomb. Or maybe they said, your shirt is the bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Just using really outdated terminology. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I don't know that the ghosts want to fight you. Like, I think they think no. you're funny. Mm -hmm. In another area, Bagans and co. held out nuggets of gold. They panned themselves earlier in the day in an effort to tempt deceased miners. Bagans shouted, I want you to show yourself. Can you manifest yourself, please? If you show yourself to us, I'll give you gold. I'm not fucking with you. One spirit took Bagans up on the offer as an infrared photo appeared to show a creepy adolescent figure sitting atop some nearby stairs. What is happening? <laughs> this is for real. Like, this is not made up. No, there's an entire segment of this episode where they are panning for gold. Yeah. And I had to fast forward it because it's yeah. very boring. They're laughing. Of, like, they think they're very charming in the river. And they get these nuggets which I think they think are real nuggets of gold. <laughs> Probably it's fool's gold. But then he offers to pay the ghost. Like, what mm -hmm. the fuck is a ghost going to do with any type of currency? No, none. Yeah. And then why are you saying I'm not fucking with you? Show <laughs> some respect. Why are you cursing at these ghosts? <laughs> yeah. And also, why can you, you manifest yourself, please? Just such <laughs> a little assy baby. <laughs> to... Well, I kept having to rewind it to type out what he was saying. And Paris was like, what the fuck is wrong with I'm this gonna person? Go, I'm going to lose my mind. You've got to stop rewinding and replaying what they're saying. He was like, I can't have this in my living room anymore. Is this almost over? You've been watching this forever. I was like, I keep getting distracted because I keep trying to rewind. I mean, I was like, I have to hear what they're saying. And a lot of the time he's shouting. He's like <laughs> actually shouting at the ghost. And he was like, this guy sounds like he's going to try to kick a ghost's ass. I, like, I appreciate I that's that what you don't use headphones when watching stuff. You're like, Full if television. I have to listen. Yeah. I'd, I'd watch everything on my laptop with headphones. You are so thoughtful. I'm like, you want to spend time with me? Good. You can watch ghost shit or here, watch murder shit. The one thing I won't do is if we're doing a really serious case and there's like really graphic like crime scene photos. But Paris is so he we are very close. We spend all of our time together, especially since the pandemic. And he'll be like, what are you working on? And we'll like sidle up on me. He learned real fast. Don't do that anymore. Because he was like, oh, my God. And also, even if it's not research for the show, Katie, one of our dear listeners, friend of the pod, was like, if you like Dr. Pimple Popper, one more gruesome is med school posts. And it mm. is like surger surgeries and horrific accidents and then mm -hmm. how they're repaired. It's like medical you know, treatment on it or whatever. Every single time it's the graphic mm. content warning on Instagram. And I am very fascinated by all that. Man, if Paris leans over, he's like, oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I can't stomach that stuff. But Tommy doesn't. That's not his thing uh, either, luckily. But uh, he if I need to know about any of that stuff, I'll just be like, hey, babe, have you heard of blah, blah, blah? And he's like, <laughs> yeah, that's like he's my litmus test for um, do I want to know about this on the Internet? Like, in, yeah, he's like, he's nope, like, don't nope, look it up. Don't. Don't, don't real, go, don't real go gross. research that. No. It's real gross. <laughs> well, spirits of the ghostly persuasion aren't the only kind you will find in Kells. The pub also has the city's largest collection of single malt scotch. Their website proudly states that Kells brings the traditions and culture of the glens of Antrim to Seattle and offers a truly authentic Irish experience. And for those looking for a paranormal experience, Kells is a favorite stop along the many haunted tours of Seattle. Whether you're looking to imbibe in some spirits or possibly encounter one, Kells Irish Pub is sure to please. And if you go on one of the nights where live music is playing, make sure you take a good look in the Guinness mirror. There's a chance Charlie will be looking back at you, smiling as the Irish tunes and merry clink of glasses fill the air. That's my one regret is we didn't have more time in Seattle so we could go and see the live band. I know. We gotta go back. 
We do. Yeah, we, for sure. We did not get a, a lot of time there. Like half a day. So I, de- mm-hmm. I definitely want to go back. Well, so what do we think? Well, I mean, we had our paranormal encounters. We did. And Several. Not only that is, you know, we got to talk to the McAleese family and they have also had their share of encounters. Mm-hmm. But I, I will agree with their take. Obviously, they're experts. And Patrick said, and I think it was in one of his interviews or it may have been when we were talking you know, he's like, I spent more time in this building than probably anybody in this yeah, last century. Yeah, we were talking, yeah. Yes, yeah, so like 1983 until now. And so, you know, he said, I never get a, you know, queasy feeling. I never feel mm-hmm. nervous. There is just kind of a buzz. And I would agree with that. When we were in the Butterworth building side, there is something around. But I never felt, even as the biggest scaredy cat I am, I never felt, okay, I have to look behind my shoulder or, mm-hmm. oh, I feel sick. Of all the ghosts I've encountered in my life, and yes, I will say, <laughs> so I've encountered multiple ghosts in my life, or spirits, energies. There have been one or two that are more sinister feeling, but I felt like all of these, it was almost like they were residual spirits just kind of moving through the space. And sadly, maybe because they had either really sudden deaths or tragic death or were mistreated after they died, they are almost t- kind of either trapped there or just, I think with the Charlie ghost and the content spirit, he's happy there. He, that yeah. party ain't going to end. He wants to just hang out. Why not and, hang out at a place where everybody's drinking, having a good time? There's live music. Yeah. And for and having a family like that that's in there, I bet the little girl wants to stick around because she's happy. And if the redheaded woman mm-hmm. is cooking, you know, it's one of those where it's kind of a welcoming place. So, of course, the ghosts don't want to leave because they're like, oh, this is a nice place. We mm-hmm. want to stay. Yeah. So I, I definitely do think there is something in there. I felt it. The apps confirmed. <laughs> yeah. But I know you you are you have a very great, like, intuition. You're really empathetic. So what, I mean, you you can look at a photograph and read a person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so impressed. <laughs> and so, Christy, I sent a Christy a, a photo of um, an ex of mine. And I, I sent a photo lineup and was like, can you pick out which person I dated? And she totally called it. So... There was there was some specifics that um... she made some specific <laughs> assumptions and she absolutely nailed all of them. I mean, even somewhere in the realm of possibility, but like spot on. So having the empathy and the intuition that you have, what do you think? I definitely felt like there was a buzz is a good word to put it or just like um, I don't want to say a heaviness because it, that to me indicates like something negative, but just like a feeling in the air in the bathroom area and then on the side where it was empty and we were just looking around, but it's the bar side where the music takes place. I definitely felt like a shift from there to when you walk over to where it wasn't the building, the Butterworth Mm -hmm. building anymore. But the the side that was open that doesn't have, there's kind of a bar, there's two bars on the bottom floor on the basement floor Mm -hmm. and the side with the patio and without the music stand, I felt like was the, that's the other building. And that's like the one that didn't really just had good vibes because it's a bar, Mm -hmm. but it didn't feel like haunted, but then the bathroom and then the other side with the bandstand in the back corner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's kind of a back hallway and that's where the staircase is and everything. Mm -hmm. That's what all kind of felt like very a buzz, like a buzz, lively, energetic feel. And I didn't feel scared. It was Mm -mm. also the middle of the day, and there were people there, and there was a lot of light. If I was there by myself at night in the dark, it might be a different uh, story, but that's, I think, anywhere I would feel a little nervous. But yeah, I thought it it had good vibes for sure. And Olivia said that they're going to start putting out, like, more signage, like, even out on the streets and stuff, so people kind of know a little bit more about the paranormal history and just the history in general of of the building. So I think it's going to be a very, if you're into that, if, well, I mean, even if you're into having a good time, if you're into ghosts, if you're into good food and music and drinks. So basically if you like anything in life, then you will like this place (laughs) because it has something for everyone, but it's especially like make their own brew. So I got their cider that they make and Mm -hmm. it was really good. Mm-hmm. I love a good cider. It was like a dry cider, and then we loved the chowder. So we had, oh yes, very good. It was chowder. overall just a good time. I had so much chowder on this trip, and I'm we not mad about it. Like so literally, many I think I had six chowders. Yes, if chowder was on the menu, it was like chowders all around. Yeah, we got to get around. 
We, like, to, we did Duke Seafood in Tacoma. They so had little good. tiny chowders. So we all got chowder samplers, and then we got a bigger bowl of the chowder that yeah. we liked the most. So in that one meal, we all had four chowders. We had four yeah. chowders. <laughs> yeah, it was called four the dinghy. Bowl. The dinghy, and it had three different, and we all rated them the same, and then we mm-hmm. we all had our favorite, and then we got a bigger bowl of that, plus like a bunch of other food. So Duke's much was food. great. It was right on the water. It was we such a nice weather. Such a lovely waitress. So nice. She, she went awesome. above and beyond to make things gluten-free for you. Mm-hmm. She, she was, was so thoughtful. So nice. Yeah. There's good, a, yeah. Good There's a dinghy of chowder. I'm going to say yes every time. Hell yeah. And it was, uh, they did not disappoint. And Kel's had good chowder. Mm-hmm. I mean, we. And it, soda the bread. The Pacific Northwest good. was good to us. It was yes. very good to us. Yeah. Food-wise. And everyone was super nice. All the clubs. Patrick and Olivia. And Madeline, their little girl, they were so nice to, like, just spend so much time with us. And it didn't mm-hmm. even, it wasn't like, well, we're going to, we feel obligated to do this. Like, they were, like, sat down, talked to us. Like, we're very friendly. We're mm-hmm. going to keep up with them and, and yeah. stuff. So, we'll definitely, on our Instagram, when we share all of our pictures that we took there and everything, we'll tag them. So, make sure you go and, and follow them. And if you're in the area, check them out because they're awesome. Good people, and then, good times. I want to go clubbing in that chapel when it opens, too. Hell yeah. Yeah. With the cloud ceiling. Looked Hell awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, speaking of live music, I don't know if there's going to be music at these shows. Could be. You don't know. It's improv. <laughs> Anything could happen. But we do have some improv shows coming up. We do. We're going to both be in the Hot Dish Improv Show on September 24th. It's a Friday at Dallas Comedy House, uh, 9 you can go PM. to our web- It's at yes, nine p.m. You can go to our website at sinisterhood.com slash live shows, and the improv shows are at the bottom. I'm also doing a storytelling show October second at the Comedy Arena in McKinney, Texas. So if you're in North Texas, and Heather then I'm McKinney doing- and McKinney, McKinney and McKinney, they had to put me on the bill because it's in my town, and if not, <laughs> I will shut that show down. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, they're very kind to reach out to ask me to tell a story, and then an improv troupe called Mama Tried is going to do an improv set based on my story. So I'm excited to see what they have to perform because it's improvised. So I don't know what they're going to do. And then October 8th, I'm also going to be in Hot Dish, which is a a rotating cast of performers at Dallas Comedy Club. So we'll put all that on the website, but more importantly on the website at the top at sinisterhood.com slash live shows. You will see links to get tickets to our live shows in Denver, October 13th, Salt Lake City, October 14th, and our Tri-City Tour of Texas, San Antonio, Dallas, and Houston at the end of October, the Halloween week. So um, go check those out. Grab tickets. Dallas show is sold out. TBD, maybe have a little announcement coming for you soon. Mm -hmm. Uh, So keep your eyes on social media, Dallas area folks. So we may have some fun in store. But here's how a Sinisterhood live show goes, because I think some people don't know. Break it down. We, it is like... You're in the studio with us. Mm -hmm. We have our our script, the part that Christy reads, and then the banter in between is completely improvised. We interact with the audience, and we're going to teach you about or talk to you about something that's in your area that's reasonably regionally close to where you're at. And then we're at the end. We do a little improvised. I'm going to leave that a surprise, but Mm -hmm. audience participation, improv session. And um, I'm thinking of... uh, Bring your grievances. I got some more grievances. Bring, bring your grievances. We are, we are, we got some bits that are normally reserved for uh, Patreon, but we're bringing them live to you because we're bringing man, our bits to you. It's we have, and I'll tell you what. I'm still thinking about. You know which grievance I'm. I'm thinking oh, about. There was a an egregious grievance. An egregious grievance. An egregious, into egregious grievance. And then if you get very the- bitter ex boyfriend. <laughs> It was uh, wild. So if you have an egregious grievance, bring it to us at the live show. You get meet and greet passes. That mm-hmm. will be after the show. They'll line you guys up. We'll talk to you, I mean, pretty much for as long as you want. We we just want to, like, get to know you, talk to you about what the show means to you, and uh, we take a little photo mm-hmm. and, uh, and sign something. We had Michelle is one of our Patreon subscribers. She had a shirt for us to sign. Mm-hmm. We signed, uh, you know, cocktail menus, whatever anybody has. So if also you want the giveaways. To- and at each stop, we have a laser engraved tumbler laser. flask, what laser <laughs> tumbler flask wine glass from High Proof Designs, which is an artisan uh, pyrographic and laser engraving company in Dallas. And uh, it says the cool Sinisterhood throwback logo on it, and we will autograph it for you. So keep your eye out on our social media 
Uh, usually about a week before the show, we'll post a giveaway. You just tag your friends in the Instagram comments. And then I found a machine on the internet that lets me copy and paste <laughs> all the comments into a machine. And then it randomizes it and it selects a name. And then you'll be our winner and we'll give it to you on stage. So yes, it's keep an eye on our social So media much fun. That. They have been so, so much fun. And I don't, I'm not just saying that because I'm in it like uh, <laughs> un, unbiased, like objectively like, a it's a fun show it's a fun we show asked others uh it is yeah. very fun for us though i walked off stage in portland and cried to christy and she said did. i'm so i'm so happy i'm living my dream i love you so much i love all these people so much uh so make my this dream come true. true especially in the houston show because it's my actual birthday october That's true. 28th yes yes We love providing Sinisterhood to you at no cost, so if you like what you hear, consider supporting the show by donating to our Patreon. We're a small operation, creating the show for you by researching, writing, recording, and producing it ourselves. Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. As a thank you, you also get some sweet perks like ad-free episodes, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group for those in the Ruling the Airwaves and Getting Into It tiers, a special shout-out on the show, a monthly bonus mini-sode, and patron-exclusive video and audio content, including our weekly audio segments like Am I the Asshole, Relationship Advice, Dear Christy. We also do uh, did a little bit of video bonus content this week, mm -hmm. and you got a, it's called Gone Rando Notten, and it is a... God damn, just a it's video. so good. It's a cinematic <laughs> masterpiece. Heather put it together. It took her hours. It's so good. I was there, and I, I laughed so hard. And then I was like, babe, have you seen this yet? And he was like, no. I was like, you need to stop what you're doing and watch this. And then he was laughing out loud. It's very funny. I said, this is proof positive that we need a television show. So it's like a 20-minute video. I'm just going to send it into the networks. <laughs> <laughs> you just submit it to us. Um, so you get all of that and more when you subscribe. And we also have this new tier, the Getting Into It tier, where you get uh, video streams, uh, live performances. So if we're not coming to your town on this tour, then you can still uh, sign up for the Getting Into It tier. And each month, you basically get a live stream show with us. And we're going to do Am I the Asshole, Judge Christie, Relationship Advice, that you get to vote on. And you also get to vote on uh, topics for the main feed, which is what the Randonautica episode was. Mm -hmm. Our Patreons in the Getting Into It tier, they picked it. So if you want to pick it, you got to sign up. The next live Patreon show is the 29th at 8 p.m. Central Time. So sign up. Uh, the voting of what that's going to be is, is currently underway. You also now have the fun perk of access to our Discord server, where you can connect with other fans in real time and discuss the latest in true crime, share personal ghost stories, or just post adorable pictures of your pets. We'll also be hopping on occasionally and hosting monthly Q&As where you can ask us all your burning questions. And our next Q&A is Sunday the 26th at 1 p.m. Central Time. We're doing a little early to accommodate some of our UK listeners so you guys aren't up at 3 a.m. Like you have been because you're so dedicated and loyal. We appreciate it so much. We love it when someone's like, woke up, I set my alarm and woke up in the middle of the night. We're like, we love you. So <laughs> it'll be, if you're in the U.S., it's like a fun Sunday brunch with mm -hmm. us. So bring a mimosa. We're not judging. Um, and for our patrons not in the U.S., you now have the option to pay in pounds or euros, saving you the cost of the conversion fee. Annual memberships for all tiers are also now available, and when you select that option, you get rewarded with a free month of membership. For more details on all of this and specific member tiers, visit SinisterHood.com and click Patreon on the top banner, and make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-out. By now, you all know Chrissy built a beautiful merch website. We have amazing, incredible designs by independent artists that we commissioned to make cool stuff. And one of those artists is Day Off, Jude Sutton, who we just got to see in Oregon. And we got to see the amazing tour shirt in person. Because Jude's mom was Jude's wearing mom, it. mom, Linda, who is also Linda. a listener and patron and so sweet, took us, took us all to dinner. Shirt looked great. Looks Better amazing. than I even imagined, yes. Linda's the perfect model for it, and you will be too. So go to Sinisterhood.com and click shop in the top banner, and you can get uh, T-shirts, clothes, mugs, totes for your kids, also clothes for your kids, but totes for yourself. You can get anything, and all of the proceeds and through the month of October will be going to the Center for Reproductive Rights, who is a policy and advocacy organization who um, helps keep our constitutional rights to privacy uh, uh, keeps keeps that right. Like SB8 right now in Texas is a rough time, but they are fighting on our behalf. 
And if you want to know more about SB8, because we've been getting a lot of legal questions since Heather is, of course, an attorney, we will be releasing um, a true crime headlines is, is essentially what it is, because there's been a lot of headlines and what's happening is is a crime against uh the, the reproductive rights of of women and those that identify as women. Uh we will be releasing that on our bonus uh, as our bonus content this week on Patreon. And Heather does a phenomenal job of explaining it and breaking it all down and what it all means. Well, thank you so much. So yeah, go to sinisterhood.com, click on shop in the top banner uh to get all that stuff and support the cause today. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. It means so much to us and really helps podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. Christy, where are you at on the computer? I am on Twitter at Christy or GTFO and on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace. Heather? I've been tweeting a lot of bathroom jokes on oh, Twitter nice. at mck versus the world and uh posting some pics on instagram at heather versus the world as always the devil rules the airwaves keep it creepy hey everybody thank you so much for supporting the show on patreon here are your special patreon shout outs brandy matthews megan tartar Haley snare jennifer zev campbell Aaron Dolak, B, Jen Five Cents, Caitlin Boyle, Laura Newman, Mary Best Deman, Olivia, Cassie Hendricks, Ashley O'Connor, Jamie, Natalie Noski, Haley Edwards, Autumn Grube, Stephanie Harris, Abigail Bickle, Dana Kelly, Nikki Algarin Shavaria, Kristen Laroe, Fallon Izell. Liz K. Hillary Simono. Aaron Decker. Aaron DeGroat. Danielle Smith. Sophia Iden. Maxine Gardner. Lauren is all the rage. Lauren. Victoria Powell. Maya Johansson. Dane J. DeProza. Pink Noir. Jessica Inman. Holly DeShrola. April Yandel. What's up, April? We went to high school together. Oh, nice. JoJo. Anna Prigorskaya. Lydia Alice Egan. Andrea Kearns. Jenna Helm. JT. Amanda. Maribel Calderon. Caroline Corville. Jackie Spivey. Aaron Krebs. Holly Powell. Christy Dorsett. Michelle Ruiz. Taylor Rainey. Chrissy Markland. Elizabeth Helstowski. Beth Dewey, Danielle Henry, Lindsay Martin, Blue Pearl Drops, Nick Aguilera, Sarah Campbell, Kayla Fisher, Lindsay Ware, Natalia Sosa, Medazalam, Rachel Atkins, Caitlin Danielson, Liz Judd, Lily, Colleen Gray, Elizabeth Lothback, Lauren Bianco, Ellen, Crystal Torres, Elise, Linda Valentine, Rachel Foster, Jennifer Winsel, Chelsea Neal, Amanda Fatanti, Andrea Halford, Emma Webb, Rose Perry, Carly Molers, Angie Moore, Stacy Bringhurst, Beverlox, Anastasia Cobb, Katrina Mathy, Rebecca Grantham, Layla Green, B Girl, Taylor, Jenna Hayward. Brianne Weisart, Casey Krug, Lauren Schultz, Roya Hurl, Sarah DeWitt, Paula Patricio, Marissa Mack, and Eve Marie Troy. Thank you guys so much for supporting the show. We hope we pronounced your names right. We sincerely appreciate all your help and support. We couldn't do this without you. Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep it creepy. <laughs> Sin is-